Welcome to the MS Dev Show, episode number 202. This week, we talk to John Daniel Trask about how you can figure out if you need an APM solution. DOS goes open source. How many new Apple gadgets did Jason and Carl get? And how many watts does it take to power your brain? Raygun gives you complete visibility on errors, crashes, and performance problems affecting your end users. Replicate issues in seconds rather than digging through log files or having to rely on users to report errors or crashes. Raygun gives you a window into how users are really experiencing your software applications. Check it out today at raygun.com. This week we have John Daniel Trask. Uh, you know, us BFFs know him as JD. He is a CEO and co-founder of Raygun. He's been coding since he was nine and he's still coding even as CEO and co-founder, which I think is super awesome. How's it going, JD? <laughs> it's going really well. I'm not sure the rest of the team likes it so much, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Always with that type of relationship. Good news, guys. I wrote some code. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it's great that you do that because otherwise, I mean, I just, I think you sort of lose something, you know, you lose like this, this connection, like you, you know, you, you sort of get out of touch. I feel like there's plenty of people that can pull it off, but I think it just helps you keep that connection to what's, uh, you know, what's actually going on in the company. So I think that's really cool. Yeah, admittedly, what I do work on these days is more around the admin and reporting bits that aren't so customer facing. <laughs> and then in my my private time, I feel like one of the major changes in the industry since I started sort of you know twenty four seven coding mm -hmm. uh, to occasionally doing emails um, was the rise of machine learning. Mm -hmm. And so I've been kind of trying to learn more about that in my my weekend coding session. So that kind of gives me a good good outlet for uh, keeping my skills up. That's pretty cool. Yeah, actually, that brings up a good question. In and like Raygun, is there are there any uh, machine learning type functionality in there yet? There's a little bit in there. Okay. Um, we do we, but it's a it's a bit too manual at the moment. Okay. Around say, for example, we do some work uh, around the grouping of errors and how they may look different, but are actually the same oh, issue. Okay. But that's more of something that the team do sort of offline and then encode the the learnings from that into more of a straightforward function. I see. Um, but yeah, we are looking at the moment at trying to hire out a machine machine learning sort of squad to just start okay. saying, hey, look, if we get a billion bits of data every you know couple of hours, there must be some really interesting stuff we could uh, do with that in terms of providing value to the customers. Absolutely. I think that's what everybody in the industry is doing right now. It's like, hey, there's this cool ML thing. Like, what can I use it for? How can I get some value out of that? <laughs> yep. So, uh, Carl, what is the comment of the week? Yeah, this week we got a comment of the week off of Twitter from Steve Harmon. Uh, and th he's referring back to the IoT Edge episode we had with Chapalo Street. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, sending a message actually directly to him. He said, just listen to your MS Dev Show episode on IoT Edge and enjoyed it. So I'm increasing your follower count by almost 10%. <laughs> 89 to go and we'll hit 100 follower goals. Yeah, Chapalo had a, a big goal of hitting 100 <laughs> followers. <laughs> so... You know, I, I don't think many people realize it, but um, I'm going to go back, make sure I've been do, uh, making sure I've been getting everybody in. But we have a, on the MS Dev Show Twitter account a Twitter list of all the guests. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go there and just see the stream of all of the guests that we've had, um, that's available there. Plus, it might make it a little bit easier for you to follow them. So if you really like one of the guests we've had, just check out that Twitter list that we have and uh, make it easy to follow on your daily stream. That's cool. I'll have to start taking a look at that more because there's probably some uh, repeat guests that we could have on too. So, Yeah, I, I think Twitter list for me fell away a little bit like once the third party like tools were really good. But mm -hmm. since Twitter kind of is kicking everybody off again, I think Twitter lists are a little bit more, at least for me, in vogue. So yeah, it's, it's a lot easier to follow different streams of people. Okay. Very cool. So how do people get mentioned on the show? If you want to get mentioned on the show like Steve, send us an email to feedback at msdevshow.com. Come on, uh, uh, comment on face to Facebook, YouTube, or Stitcher. And we really like those five-star iTunes reviews. Absolutely. So we have a couple news stories here, and I know it, it's, it's, uh, it's been a little bit longer gap since we had the last episode. So people are probably thinking, oh, good, they're going to go over Ignite announcements. We are, but not in today's episode. We're actually going to have a special episode just for Ignite announcements. And I actually think the timing is really good. I, I listened to some other podcasts where they were talking about Ignite announcements. And basically, they had to, you know, sort of repeat everything that they that they heard at the event. Um, 
things have sort of settled now and I, we're getting, you know, more news in and I've actually been able to talk to some of the people involved in some of the Ignite stuff. So I think we're going to have a really good Ignite episode. So uh, I believe that's going to be the next one. So make sure you listen to that one. Um, so let's jump into some of the other stories though. Uh, the first one here, what's the best framework to build desktop apps in 2018? Yeah, I think as we've kind of made the shift to the cloud and web and kind of stuff like that, a lot of people are sitting there like, you know, hey, I still need to make a desktop app. Mm -hmm. And with Microsoft doing certain things and the community like Electron and stuff taking shape, you know, what is the best of, uh, you know, for your situation? You might have to target maybe like Windows XP or maybe you can get by with only uh, targeting Windows 10. So there's this Reddit thread here that really kind of goes through what are your options if you want to build a desktop app today. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think if you follow that, uh, if you're in that scenario, you might want to take a look at this because there isn't one blanket answer. Right. Um, And, uh, but there's actually enough guidance on here. I think that if you sit there and follow the choose your own adventure path, you you can get down to one or two technologies where that that will be a lot simpler for you to look into and investigate those two good options instead of looking at the 30 desktop options that um, you have in total. Yeah, I was just looking through the list. I mean, there is a lot. <laughs> so I, what would your go-to be, Carl, like if you were writing a new Windows application? Would it be UWP? So if I can afford to only target Windows 10, mm-hmm. for me, it's UWP. It's yeah. um, If for some reason there's like a feature you just can't live without that UWP is limited on, I would jump down to WPF. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not one of the, the web technology guys, so I don't really, I'm not really a huge fan of Electron. I don't really like how those apps, uh, just chug through memory and stuff like that. Uh, plus I like the distribution through the store. Right. So I would like, you know, if you stay within the win 32 technologies, it's really easy to use the desktop bridge to bring some of those, um, non-store technologies to the store. How come PWA isn't on this list? I think it's kind of interesting that it's completely omitted. I don't see it in anybody's answer. Yeah. You know, you know, it's one of those that, you know, that comes down to that it, you know, it's even though it is a web technology in this case, it's also a desktop technology. Yeah. Maybe so, that's why they're not thinking of, yeah, it's not. Yeah. I just did a search. It's not mentioned at all. Well, anyway, and, 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 yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, this thread is for desktop developers. So even though that is an option, that's not going to be the first thing on most desktop developers minds. Yeah. I would consider it though, even if I was, I guess if it was strictly desktop, then I, I, I guess that makes sense. Cause then it seems like you're, you're sort of, you know, limiting yourself artificially. Um, okay. We can move on to the next one here. How many calories are burned during com- doing computer programming? I would say zero extra <laughs> over <laughs> sitting there doing nothing. Not enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of interesting because you know, as developers, you know, so, so some of us don't think much about health and fitness, but yet, you know, a lot of developers I do uh, encounter do think about health and mm-hmm. fitness a lot. And, you know, where does, you know, the, the strain of computer work, uh, you know, enter into this? And even though there's like no direct study on programming itself, there is, you know, on, you know, a lot of studies on how much the brain um, uses while thinking hard and solving those mental problems. Um, so if you compare sleeping as like the baseline for a half hour of sleeping, you'll burn 19 calories. Well, that sounds pretty so, good. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> Computer work will burn 51 calories in a half hour. So that's 102 calories an hour you'll burn wow. just by just by sitting behind a computer and thinking. I think I'm going to go on the sleeping diet whenever I'm I feel hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to go to sleep and burn 19 calories. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Okay. So make sure you think very hard, like don't be lazy then, right? <laughs> if the answer comes to you quickly, think of alternative answers. Yeah. I thought one of the other like little fact nuggets that are on here is the a typical adult human brain runs on about 12 watts. Oh, that is interesting. So it, on there, it said like, you know, a fifth of a light bulb. Yeah. But if you convert to LED, that's like one light bulb. Yeah. That's interesting. 
Now, see, I'm thinking. I'm yeah. thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just did it, Carl. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking it's Small interesting to. Yeah. Go to interesting way to think about it is it, it is the efficiency of compute power there, right? Intel, AMD, and Apple have a long way to go. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, <laughs> 12 watts, and it's still the most powerful supercomputer in the world. Yeah. <laughs> That is amazing. Although, although getting the right, the, the power conversion is super inefficient. <laughs> <laughs> this is right. We also suffer from garbage in, garbage out just as badly as a computer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe worse. Uh, okay. Microsoft open sources MS-DOS 1.25 and 2.0. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So you go to GitHub uh, off of our show notes page mm-hmm. and there's a link to the GitHub page where the source code for both of those versions of MS-DOS are. Um, it, it is said on there that, it, you know, this is for historical purposes. We are not accepting pull requests. I, I think that's funny that that has to be mentioned. Um, but if you want to see how those original operating systems uh, were written, um, I, th- I believe they're all assembler. Yeah, um, it's all that ASM. Get, it's all tiny yeah, you, too. <laughs> yeah, check that out. I mean, it, it's really cool. And they even supply the uh, um, binaries too. Okay, command.asm. Can I understand any of this code? No. <laughs> this is crazy. I'm, I'm kind of curious why they stopped at two. Yeah, I, I don't know. Secret source in three? Yeah, three <laughs> was when it started getting good. The first one I started like really using was 4.1, no, 4.2. No, no, it would have been way before that. It would have been version three. It would have been version three. I, four was a big upgrade. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. There must be patents in version three. <laughs> <laughs> I, what, what's crazy about this, since it is assembly, is that, you know, like the comments uh, pretty much exceed the actual amount of code in here. It's like, here's what's actually going on here right now. So that's pretty cool. I, I'm, I'm going to take some time and actually look through that. I think that's pretty cool. And then, J.D., before the show, you were talking about this, which I thought was really cool, was Windows 95 running in – it's running in WebAssembly in your browser, which I think was pretty cool as well. <laughs> like it actually boots and is like running like a Windows 95 instance in your browser. It's it's pretty cool. And uh, I, I think I made the comment – I run it through the Electron host and yeah. – uh, the bit that I found interesting was that if you looked at the amount of memory that Windows 95 was using, it was about six megabytes. And then at the host level, it was using about 300 megabytes to run uh, <laughs> the Electron process itself. <laughs> um, <laughs> under, underscoring Carl's point earlier. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I thought that was cool. It was also a good reminder of how far we've come. It's easy to forget. You know, uh, I, I think I mentioned earlier as well, that I fired up the task manager and all it really is, is the alt tab menu. You can just choose which app you want to have focus. Yeah. Um, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, we moved forward <laughs> slightly. But uh, yeah, it was cool. It's very cool. Yeah. I, I know. And, and, and this is a bit of nostalgia, but yeah, if you think back like a floppy disk, you know, every photo you take now is bigger than a floppy disk. <laughs> I mean, we just like, and we just throw away the memory like it's nothing. Like, uh, you know, oh, Teams, you know, it's taking up a gig of memory. And I'm like, yeah, I got I got memory to spare. <laughs> I also liked seeing some of those older technologies like uh, Microsoft Briefcase. Yes. You know, arguably Ooh. the forerunner to Dropbox, but trying to handle PCM CIA cards and that's been in there. <laughs> that was that was in there until at least recently. Are you sure it isn't even it might even be Windows 10. <laughs> it's probably still in there somewhere. If you search for Briefcase, it would not shock me if it's still there. <laughs> Yeah, search the registry. You might have to activate it there. Yeah. <laughs> Briefcase. I'll get right on well. that, guys. <laughs> yeah. So we'll have a link to all of that. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about that's, uh, I think, sort of newsworthy is just a whole bunch of hardware releases. You know, Apple had a whole bunch of hardware releases. Um, they had uh, basically these these new phones. Uh, I think one thing that's kind of interesting about them is Apple, like how far ahead they are in like chip design. And uh, I don't know if you saw the benchmark that on single core performance, like the new iPhone uh, XS is actually beating the MacBook Pro. Um, like in, it was in some JavaScript benchmark. I mean, it's obviously like super selective, but the fact is like the, the actual computing power on there is, is just kind of ridiculous, especially when we think back to like, you know, like the Windows 95 that we we're talking about, the amount of memory, um, all the resources that are going on. So I was, um, I had a, I had a seven plus before, and, um, which was actually wasn't too bad. Like I didn't feel like a huge need to upgrade except the fact that I only, 
I had the 32 gig version and uh, basically my apps and the OS took up about 22, which meant that I had about 10 gigs for photos. And I like to take 4K video as well. <laughs> um, 4K video in 10 gigs, that's that's like, you know, if you're on vacation, that's a day. Um, I kept using that up. So I went ahead and I picked up the iPhone 10s max, um, which I think is a bit, it's, it's cool. It, it, since I'm not looking at it, it masks all of my secret information there. Um, cause it does have face ID, a face ID doesn't bother me as much as, uh, as much as I thought it would. I, I actually think it's really good. Um, but what's kind of interesting, I, I don't know why they call it the max. They should have called it the plus cause it's identical size. I don't know if anybody else had this in their head, but I was thinking that this thing was going to be bigger than a plus actually my old phone, my phone holders in my car and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff still work. Uh, so it works out pretty good. The thing is ridiculously expensive, but I did get the 256 version so I can take lots. It's, you know, it's, it's like 25 times bigger when you think about it. Cause I only had 10 gigs free and now I basically have like 240. So it's like 24 times bigger than, than what I had. Camera's great. I mean, I don't need to review, do like a full review, but, uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. And I finally was able to switch over to wireless charging. I know you switched over a while ago, Carl and JD, since you're in the Android camp, uh, you probably switched over like 20 years ago <laughs> to, <laughs> to wireless charging. <laughs> well, no, actually, uh, on, on Android, the whole reason I'm on there now is I, I used to use iPhones. I, I yeah. even had to do the old jailbreaking to make it work in New Zealand back in the day when the first one came out. Oh, you Probably couldn't use it the there. First five. Yeah, it <laughs> didn't work at all. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but when I moved to the US, uh, because I needed a US phone number in my New Zealand one, I kind of kept the New Zealand one on the iPhone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I had an Android phone for VR. Yeah, and I just started using that, and I I kind of just started to like it. So yeah, it's not it's not a particularly religious view. I yeah. still use iPads quite a lot, but um, yeah, I'm I'm enjoying the uh, Pixel phone. I'm looking forward to that Pixel three announcement yeah. next week. I hope. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think they're I think they're doing a fantastic job on that side. I'd be leery to get a, a phone from Samsung just because of like the 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 lock in there and the fact that it's like this weird relationship between Samsung and Google. But uh, the fact that there's like the Google Pixel phones now, I think makes it really appealing. I think there's a lot of people that are, you know, iPhone users that are, you know, especially like us kind of geeky devs are really looking at it because of the, the additional power you get. Um, I will say there's the shortcuts app now in iOS, which gives me some of what I was looking for. Um, I can, I can get in the car and have it like turn off Wi-Fi, open up ways. I can have it start my podcast. I can do all that kind of stuff, which I think is great. Um, but the shortcuts app, it just, it falls short, uh, to be honest. Um, I don't, it's Apple and it's their app. Now they purchased, uh, what was the app? They purchased workflow and it's Apple now that the, the app should have like full access to everything and it can go in and like change your volume levels and turn on and off Bluetooth and change your screen brightness. So like they gave it power from that perspective, but they didn't give it any power to have any interesting triggers. You literally can use Siri to do it or you have to open up the shortcut app or you can make a shortcut like on your what have you on your home screen. But like why can't the thing work with like a geofence, you know, when I get home? Mm. So, you know, obviously they're leaving more announcements now for next year. So that'll be all the, the announcements next year will say, and you can, now we can go back and like play this clip back, but it'll be, you know, Hey, now, you know, you can geofence, you know, triggering your shortcuts and or when you connect to specific Bluetooth connected. Device. Yeah, exactly. Cause, cause you want it to like know when it's in your car and kick off. The other thing is like, you know, Apple is just psycho about their background tasks. So what I did was, you know, I'm like, I'm like, there's no way this thing will run in the background, but you can launch apps and be like changing settings. Right. So I made a shortcut that what it did was it would like change a setting and then it would launch an app and then it would start a timer. And I set it for like five seconds and then it would pop up a notification. So it would say hi from shortcuts, right? Five seconds works. So then I set it for two minutes, two minutes goes by no notification because wow. iOS is killing its own app. And not letting the shortcut in the shortcuts app just says like, oh, yeah, that's cool. Like, yeah, you can totally wait for two minutes and then display a notification, but it just never happens. So, you know, there's um, there's just limitations in there. I just don't get it. Um, I guess, you know, they still have to be concerned with battery life because you can do like scripting and you can do this crazy thing where it goes through and like text each of your contacts. Uh, uh, Miguel de Casa on Twitter, he, he made one that literally looped through every contact and sent them a request for Apple pay money for like a hundred bucks. He said, it's my birthday, please, you know, Apple pay me a hundred dollars. <laughs> um, but even then too, like 
uh, you have to, there are like all these safeties, you know, whenever it goes to send a text, it will, uh, it'll actually pop up and you still have to hit send. Uh, there's that type of thing, but it is nice. Like you can do things like figure out, um, how far away, how, what the, the ETA for me getting home would be based on my current location, take that, put it into this text, uh, text that to my wife. Um, but again, you know, you kick that, that process off and it's like, it pops up messages then. And it's like, Hey, we've totally done everything for you, but you need to push send. Um, which I understand is sort of a safety, but I wish there were some ways to disable that. So I just think the whole app falls a little short and I think that they will, um, I think some of the things like the geofencing and the, whenever you connect to certain Bluetooth, uh, mark my words, that'll be like announcements for next year. And they'll act like, you know, it's like the greatest thing ever. Like, Oh, we totally thought of this. And, but it's just clearly just missing at this point. And it's frustrating. So in other Apple tech news, so I did get the, I also got the Apple watch Four. So I was using the series zero, which I don't happen to have sitting here next to me. Um, it wasn't called series zero. It was just the original Apple watch. And the thing was like the slowest thing on the planet. Um, everything I used it for was just really slow. So I really only used it for notifications, uh, but I did get the new uh, cellular version. And this new one is blazing fast. I mean, this thing's like five times faster than the previous gen. Uh, it takes like 30 seconds to boot. It updates really quickly. Um, it's just they've, they've made like massive improvements in those types of things. But um, what I like about it is I can go out, I can ride my bike, I can go kayaking and I can just take this and I can still make uh, an emergency call, take an emergency call. And then you can also, you know, listen to podcasts. Overcast has been updated to uh, uh, to work really well with that. So I'm definitely enjoying that and I can leave my, I can leave my iPhone behind, um, you know, for those types of things. And so that's pretty, that's pretty freeing. So actually, if you were going to get one thing this year, one Apple device this year, if you had an old watch, I'd recommend getting the new watch, stick with your old phone if you can. And, uh, and then I'd probably like next year, pick up like a used, uh, like 10 R or something. If you want to go the, the budget route, but I'm, you know, Carl and I were on the, the trickle down system, you know, so everybody in the family, when we get a new phone. It goes down the ranks. So, <laughs> yeah. So, unfortunately, for this year is not one of those trickle down years for me. Yeah. Um, I I got the eight um, plus last year. Yeah. And and we usually like to keep them at least two years. Yeah. So, the phones were out of the question for me. I still have no reason to upgrade my phone. Yep. I actually upgraded my watch later than you. I had the original one like you I did. Yeah. But I couldn't. I couldn't stand how slow it was. So I've got the series two. Which is just fine. It, I got the latest what Watch OS five. That's good. and I got. I couldn't update and, mine. And uh, you know all the new features like walkie talkie. We were playing around with that what yesterday or the day before. Yeah. Um, so you know it, it works fine. Um, it's not as fast as yours, but you know what? To be honest, with how little you know new things there were in Apple this year compared to last year, if you had gotten the uh, the 10 X last year, mm -hmm. uh, I would not be interested at all no. in, in this one. Uh, so we're thinking we might actually wait three years instead of two years between upgrades, just yeah. between how happy we are still today compared to how we've been in the past. Yeah. Well, that's good. So, that's very sensible, so, Carl. So because of that, I mean, because Apple's products were so good last year, we're not even thinking about new products. <laughs> yeah, I uh, not I, I'm not trying to tempt you or anything, but I, I. Oh, there's that emergency alert. Are you getting it there, too? Yep, I got yeah, the presidential alert now. <laughs> what? What That's doing? an interesting. Oh, I, oh I, I forgot. I have a whole rack of devices here. They're all going off. That's what's going off. <laughs> I literally have like a, I have one of those charging racks. I'll we'll have to include that in the show notes. That's a good piece of gear I got. So I have a, I have a whole bunch of devices for like the family. They're all charging like in their own little slots. <laughs> so I'll include that in the show notes, but I'm like, I'm like, it's not my phone going off anymore. It's all my other devices. But anyway, what I was saying, I, I, I'm really enjoying the, uh, the watch. I got the, I got the big one. So I have the gigantor screen on it and, um, it actually, I can actually run the apps on it. Um, but I am using it, you know, more and more for like exercise and, and things like that. So I'm really enjoying it. But anyway, enough talking about that. I do want to talk about Raygun and I really wanted to talk about APM in general. I didn't want to specifically make it about Raygun or anything like that. But I did need to throw like a huge disclaimer here in the beginning that we're totally biased and totally shills because uh, Raygun is a sponsor of the podcast. Uh, which is funny cause JD, like he did, he totally forgot about that. Like whenever we started, so we should have done the whole thing and then mention 
need it. <laughs> like, hey, you know, you guys sponsor the show. <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to throw that out there as a disclaimer. I think we can still be like re- relatively unbiased. Obviously, JD, you know, is going to be pitching his product. But, um, you know, we just we want to talk about APM in a general sense, because I think there's a whole bunch of benefit. And then we can talk about the landscape and, and things like that. Um, and then obviously, you know, you're free to, to talk about, you know, the, the benefits of, of your product, of course, but, um, that's, that's basically how we want to do this. So I think the first thing we should start with, since I've been using an acronym and not explaining it, we should say, what is APM? <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah. Well, it, it, and there's actually some debate around that as well as originally it seemed to be application performance management Mm -hmm. and then it sort of evolved to being more about application performance monitoring Uh, and uh, really the way that the market though uh, sort of has gone is it's usually about putting something on your server tracking the behavior of the software that's running maybe including some server metrics as well like what's the cpu and memory looking like but really profiling the application a little bit in production to help you identify where bottlenecks are where scaling issues might exist, how many requests you're managing, is the response time too slow, or you know, are you are you good? All of that sort of stuff, sort of bundled in there. And then over time, as you're aware, we we started off building other products like software crash reporting and real user monitoring. APMs kind of broadened out into just encapsulating all of these different types of uh, products out there in the market. Um, so it's quite a broad, nebulous term, you know. Ne- but you've never heard of that happening in the technology industry. <laughs> um, but yeah, and and there's certain certain definitions that different people hold hold to be true. But it's quite broad in general. So you know, as, as we're talking about performance, and you know, especially capturing metrics around performance, when when do we hit that state when when we should probably take action on uh, you know a set of performance characteristics that are happening? Yeah. At- well, I'm always a, a huge advocate for um, thinking about the the end user, um, and I might I might say customer a lot in the in this conversation. I mean the end user by that. If something is not actually impacting the customer, it's probably not worth your time to go and look into. Um, you, maybe you have other drivers. For example, you might say actually there's a cost to our business. Where there might be like 50 servers needed, and if we optimize this, we could have five. And the customer may not notice any difference in terms of performance. It's just to reduce some costs. But largely, the first thing I look at is, yeah, what is the business value? Is it to reduce costs? Is it to make the customer happier? Um, largely, if it doesn't meet those two requirements, don't do it. I, it's funny because I've never thought of this to reduce costs. I, I, I guess I guess I'm not a very good business person. <laughs> but that for whatever reason, it never crossed my mind. I was always thinking like, you know, I'm thinking more about performance, right? Like this thing is slow, but, but you're right. I mean, a lot of these big enterprise architectures, especially like what Carl and I work with, you know, where there's like so many servers involved, if you can go in there and, and, and optimize performance, you can start reducing cost. I mean, it, yeah, yep. it's pretty dramatic. Yeah. And I mean, we talked a little bit about old coding that I did and, um, you know, one of the projects, one of the last customer sort of affecting projects I worked on was our source map processing mm-hmm. pipeline for JavaScript errors. And we had several different servers just crunching away on these all day long. And I, I just happened to hear that we had all these servers doing it. And I was like, that's, that's ridiculous, right? I don't want to be... <laughs> I don't want to be paying for all these servers. And so that was a weekend project where I optimized that down where the same single server could process a day's worth of work in 20 minutes um, and we could get rid of all of the other ones. And the thing that is different about our business versus probably what a lot of uh, sort of uh, tech companies are, we're not venture backed. So for us, every dollar we save is a dollar we can put into Mm -hmm. growth and all of that sort of stuff. So that was where for us, the customers didn't necessarily notice how many servers we had, mm-hmm. um, but it certainly allowed us to accelerate our business further by reducing that cost. And I sometimes like to, you know, regardless of who who you actually cloud host with, I like to think, you know, I'm not in the business of trying to make Jeff Bezos richer than he is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's super interesting. Yeah. And, so, and oh, go ahead, Carl. I, I was going to say, you know, like, you kind of broke those into two different categories. So are you looking at two different or or two different metric categories when you're looking at, you know, what affects end users versus what can help me uh, save the most money? I, I tend to look through those two, two lenses myself. First and foremost is always the customer. I mean, there's certain situations where we've looked at performance issues and kind of gone, 
hey, look, we can resolve that right now by throwing money at it, i.e. more servers, that sort of thing. And then we will work on the technical delivery of a more efficient solution over the coming weeks or months um, but to do that. I guess my specific question is, is, is there any per performance metrics that you look at that are common to both of those those viewpoints? Or, or do they kind of sit in their own worlds and kind of consume different resources? Are some of them, you know, bandwidth and 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 like ping times or CPU memory bounding, you know, you know, what, what kind of things are we looking at here when we're talking about performance? Well, I do break down the metrics for those into two buckets. So for example, in classic sort of APM land, what they'll be measuring is the response time of the server. How long does a server take to respond to a request? And that's super useful to know. Um, and a lot of them also provide that as an average, which uh, is a lie. Um, and then the... <laughs> <laughs> the the other thing that's that's changed as well is that measuring the server today is not enough. You actually have to measure the end user's um, experience in terms of, take for example on the web, when's the page actually ready? So we have, and, and again, not being salesy, but we have a real user monitoring product that measures how long until a page is actually ready for a user to interact with it. And the thing that's actually changed a lot in the last decade, and we're seeing this across the board, is server response times are usually not too bad. But the amount of time the browsers are spending on their React frameworks and all of that sort of stuff can be many, many seconds. Even when you're talking about developers who are running high performance machines, you know, and you touched on it uh, earlier, Jason, about the uh, JavaScript performance on phones. You know, this is why that's so important. These things are hideously uh, poor performing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so there's that when you come to the users, you just want to say, is it is it fast and snappy? How long are they waiting? And then I want a distribution. I want to know. What's the worst 1% of experiences that users have? What's the P90? You know, what is the last 10% rather than just an average? Um, and I always use the uh, story, you know, like I could, um, you know, Bill Gates goes to deliver a TED talk and the average uh, net worth in the room is not a billion dollars, right? Um, that's how bad averages are. That yeah. No one actually matches that. Then you go to the cost side. Right, which is how do we improve efficiency and all of that. And that really comes down to things that are not even visible to the customer, which is just to say, okay, we want to see how tapped out are our servers, how much capacity do we have on them, um, what is actually chewing up all the time? Is it our code? Is it our database queries? Um, do we have common issues in there? So one of the things that we automatically detect, for example, is N plus one query problems that are really easy to introduce, but as you scale up, they can really start to gobble up a lot of time on the response time for customers. That'll also put more weight on your database servers, that sort of thing. So it's quite a different body of metrics that you're probably gonna go and look at if you're thinking about just the cost side. Again, if your customers are actually having a great experience though, that's usually when you can start going, well, how do we do cost optimization uh, on, the, on the back end as well? Um, hopefully that answers your question. Oh. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was sort of thinking about that. You were talking about some of the, the separate metrics and it, it sort of sounds like a taxonomy to me. Like you have the, the user response time and then there's like everything that goes into that, right? You can sort of picturing it like you're zooming in, like, you know, this, this user, it took five seconds, let's zoom in, you know, okay. It took client side, it took three server side, it took two, let's zoom into client side. It took view two seconds and you know, like you can just like keep zooming in. So I assume that, that you get that kind of functionality then. Yeah. So we've sort of dialed up a lot of that. Uh, I always talk about it as going from the 30,000 foot view to the subatomic mm -hmm. particle, right. right? Like when I have a problem I'm trying to deal with, I can't have just aggregates and, and no traces, mm -hmm. I, you know, uh, um, and a lot of products out there, I think due to just the, the stage that they were developed in, i.e. 10 years ago or so, the compute power and resources and the cheapness of doing things wasn't quite there. Mm -hmm. And so they're often giving you charts and you sort of try and divine what's going on. And I, I use the example of in the health sector, right? It's like I hook, I hook you up uh, to you know, a heart meter and it tells me you're healthy or it tells me you're dead. You know, it doesn't tell me why you're dead. It doesn't, you know, um, it's just a high level. And that's why a lot of the tools work these days. Yeah. And that leads into things like observability. I mean, with what we're doing, um, you could hit our website and I could probably go down and tell you exactly how long every single method that executed on your request took inside my C Sharp code, how long the JavaScript took, and I could watch that across your, your whole session if I wanted to be at that level. You still need the higher level stuff, though, to, to sort of yeah. say, okay, well, we need some information radiators around the office so the team kind of go, hey, 
it looks dead. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, yeah. that is kind of a unique uh, insight too. Cause I, you know, I'm just thinking of like the, the health industry. What always blew me away is like, I, w- I think we were at a museum one time and, and we had this uh, like fake patient and we had to diagnose it. And there was only like 10 different diagnoses. Right. And all we could do is like, check the the heart rate, uh, check breathing, see if the patient was distressed. It was actually amazing how few metrics we we actually had. So, you know, with something like this, like we have this wealth of information and it's more about like getting to the bottom of what's going on versus like having like, you know, <laughs> response time. And this person's time was slow. Oh, why is that? I don't know. That's all I can tell you. Um, yeah. it would be kind of interesting too, to, to start, you know, we were talking about like machine learning earlier. It would be kind of interesting to like, start to identify that. I don't know if you've seen these products where you can identify, um, you know, like the loads in your house, like you can monitor like the overall power usage in your house and it'll see like if there's this load that goes up, you know, turns on for like five minutes and then shuts off machine learning can like sort of look at that and say, Hey, we just noticed that your, um, you know, your furnace turned on for, for five minutes based on that, that aggregate value It'd be kind of neat to like start to, to use machine learning to get some insights like that. Anyway, I'm sort of on a tangent, but <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're exactly right because a lot of the stuff that's going to be going through a, a system like ours or anyone else in mm-hmm. the industry, it's already machine data. Um, you've kind of got that element, you know, I talked about garbage in, garbage out before. It's like, well, it's structured enough that you can kind of do some interesting stuff with it mm-hmm. already. Um, so I see it as one of those low hanging fruit sort of categories of, of, of where we can do some interesting stuff. I think that's one of the challenges at the moment with AI and machine learning and all of that stuff at the moment is everybody always likes to jump to, you know, I have Jarvis and it runs <laughs> right. for me. You know? <laughs> um, step one, and, invent but, Jarvis, yeah. question mark, question yeah. mark, and step three, profit. <laughs> exactly. Um, but the nature of our data is it's kind of like, well, this is actually pretty straightforward to process right. and, and right. do some some analysis on. Yeah, that's a good point. And then, I, I, you know, I, a lot of the people that I work with, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've probably heard this too, Carl, where, you know, we're, we're working with these partners and, and they are complex architectures. And I've heard so many people say like, you cannot build and run a system like this without without doing this kind of monitoring. Like you have to have an APM solution. Um, so I just kind of wanted to get your get your take on that. You know, like I don't I don't know if anybody ever has run like a, you know, I don't know what the most complex system ever run without APM was, but I mean that that probably explains like some of the early like Twitter outages and those types of things. So I, I just want to see what your insight was on that. Mine or Carl's? <laughs> oh, yours, JD. Like I, I wanted, I was curious. I, I just know Carl yeah. has, has probably heard the same type of thing. So JD, I just yeah. wanted to kind of hear, you know, like, like, are you sort of of the same opinion? Like, should every application have APM or is there, is there sort of a line that you, that you cross, you know, where you should start thinking about it? And I know that Carl sort of asked you something similar in yep. the beginning, but, yeah. um, you know, like, should I just always put it in like no matter what? I, I would say uh, if it's a business application, mm-hmm. sure. You know, you don't need to run it on your blog. Um, it's it's not really required there. But anything of any sophistication that you're putting money into, um, you know, should certainly be thinking about it. Yeah. There's a lot of talk about what percentage of, say, the project cost should be allocated to the ongoing monitoring and maintenance of, of that product. Um, so I think so. Um, I would say we weren't using a hardcore APM product before we built one. Mm. Um, the reason being that we we try really hard to not look hard at a space before we go into it so that we don't bias all our thinking just to build a Me Too product, which is why our, our approach is quite different. However, this also led us to quite like significantly slowing down our development because as data was coming through, the team were like, Oh wow! I didn't know we had that issue. I'm going to go and fix that. You know, oh like, yeah, oh, yeah, there's an issue over here, and <laughs> it's like, ADD, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it became like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We still have to ship this product rather than <laughs> fix everything it's telling us about. Um, so that was that was quite fun. I I do think that there's a lot of complexity these days that's easy to lose. Um, you know, and rightly or wrongly. As I mentioned, 10 years ago or even further back, we didn't really have the resources to collect enough data to really tell you the whole mm-hmm. picture in a, in a way that wasn't cost prohibitive. Um, and nowadays, the prices are going down. The APM category itself has about a $5 billion a year spend in it. Um, so it's already quite large. Mm-hmm. And it's growing, uh, according to Gartner, at about 12.9% per annum. So it's still a relatively high growth category with a lot of uh, money being spent in it. 
um, which tells me that the market in general is sort of seeing the value in there. It's not shrinking. People are kind of going, how do we get more of this in here? Right. Makes sense. So what about adding an APM product to like on-premises style uh, software, especially ones that are only run on the local network and stuff like that? You know, is, is that easy to wire in or is that difficult? Um, well, if it can't see the internet, they couldn't use our product, but there are players out there that do on-prem uh, related stuff. The thing that I'm finding interesting these days, though, is is a lot of folks, I think as the cloud offerings and SaaS offerings have become more and more popular, you do get those folks that go, hey, do you do on-prem? And it's like, yeah, it's going to start at like six or seven figures. And it's like, wait, what? I just want a box product. It's like, yeah, <laughs> those, those days are kind of gone you you know your box product now might be an open source solution that you bolt in the challenge with some of those and some of them are great don't get me wrong um but you've got to you've still got to invest a whole lot of time in them you know one of the ones that came up recently in the overall industry right was gdpr Mm -hmm. so we're fully gdpr compliant around data but i'm sitting here looking at a bunch of these tools that are open source i'm like are companies aware that these things have no GDPR auditing capabilities <laughs> built in? And That's a I wrote point. a po- yeah, well, I wrote a post about this recently where I actually think the engineering and ops team, whether you're DevOps or broken apart, is actually probably the biggest GDPR risk in a lot of companies because yeah. we're trying to do stuff. We've got a lot of lot of work to do. We just kind of keep pushing forward. We forget that we're logging files somewhere and installing random tools that processes data. And, yeah, yeah, you know. It's that's, almost behind like a dev risk. firewall, right? Like the business is like, oh, we have this software, but then there's like, you're right. Like the devs are like doing this stuff that's like one layer back. And unless somebody asks them like, hey, we're looking for this type of GDPR violation <laughs> or compliance, yeah. you know, unless you specifically ask them. And and it's amazing like how many people you mentioned GDPR to and they're still like, what's that? And it's like, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And and just kind of, Looping back to your, to your question, though, um, mm. originally, Carl, it's if they can see the internet, they can use a tool like ours. If it's totally locked off, you know, air gapped, that sort of thing, then they, they're going to have to find somebody who does an on prem solution, but that usually comes with quite a high cost. Um, so, yeah. So, how do you handle the GDPR, GDPR aspect then? You have a way of issuing requests to like delete swaths of data? Yeah, so we can uh, basically we've automated the process so that any Raygun customer can basically complete the GDPR uh, documentation and mm-hmm. sign that through our web portal. So that's pretty straightforward. We then keep those contracts on hand. Then we built a range of tools that allow our customers to be able to audit uh, all of the information they have. So the, because we're kind of like a an infrastructure provider, if you mm-hmm. think of it that way, it's likely that let's say um, you know you're running a business and you get hit with a GDPR request to tell me what you've got. And then you have to go out to all of the people that you send data to and say, what have you got on this? We have the tools to come back and say, okay, here's here's what we have about that. And then that person may say, can you delete this please? You know, and then you come back and say, yeah, cool. So we had to build all of the tooling to make sure that we could do that nice and easily. Haven't actually had a request yet um, around, well, actually that's a lie. We had one, which I found very perplexing, which was a person who said, can you please remove all of the information about me? And it was like, okay, cool, that's done. And then they replied and they said, thank you, which had their signature block with all their data in it. And I was kind of like, <laughs> well, you, how, just, how you, just, you just started the process over again. Now you have to contact my email provider. <laughs> yeah, so... It's interesting days. I mean, I do I do hope that the United States actually adopts similar legislation, um, although I would be a fan of maybe waiting a year or two, which is going to be the minimum they do anyway, yeah. just to see what are the wrinkles that come out of this, because it was actually done pretty well, but there's enough gray areas like that that you kind of want to see where, where are the... Where are the wrinkles? Yeah, I'm still not sure what's going to happen when, you know, like one of the big ones is like a crime is committed and then you you like immediately try to delete the evidence and like the police haven't, you know, issued like a warrant or anything. So like you have to comply with the deletion and then the police come by and they're like, we need this data. And you're like, I just deleted it at the be at the at the request of the criminal. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, and this this is the. This kind of comes down to the whole question of who owns data, right? Yeah. And uh, this is, so let's take, for example, the data that we ingest. We're always been very firmly of the view, this is not actually our data. And even when we talk about machine learning, it's kind of going, well, how do we just take the data that we got from that customer and provide insight rather than polluting and cr- 
mm. using the Ghostbusters thing. We don't want to cross the beam that uh, that causes problems. Um, you know, the data stays entirely inside and, and related to you. So I think the it, the legislation's going that way where you as the consumer own your data. Um, and I think that's going to cause some trouble for quite a few companies that like to think they own any data they receive. Yeah, so I, I know Microsoft has gotten a lot of flack for this for, you know, sending telemetry data. Um, you know, so Microsoft has just gotten more and more clear about like, this is w- what we're sending and this is why we're sending it. Um, so I don't know, you know, I don't know if there's any additional privacy concerns then with with using an APM. Obviously, like you said, you want to use one that is GDPR compliant. That seems kind of obvious. So that seems like a really good competitive advantage there. But I, I don't know if, the, if there's any other thoughts you, you have on that, you know, because companies, you know, like as a dev, you want to like track all of this stuff. And I know you said that the the user owns the data, but like, what about telemetry and stuff like that? Like, I don't, what are your thoughts on that? Well, firstly, I think, um, to be fair to Microsoft, I think they're probably best in class for transparency around what's coming through. Uh, you know, it's, uh, a, a lot of people like to say, you know, it's the new Microsoft. I actually just think, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of the large corporates like this, they have so much more to lose than say a small vendor, Mm -hmm. um, that, they are often actually adhering beyond what is reasonably expected, which is good. I mean, they've they've what I've seen, for example, with the VS Code stuff, I think is the one that comes to mind. Um, maybe even the .NET Core bits reporting in. You know, they tell you how you can go and disable it if you want to. But mm-hmm. the thing is, this is what's helping them improve the products for everybody. They've given clear explanations about how it's not personally identifiable. It's nothing that's going to um, you know, expose proprietary source code or anything to them. Um, so I think that's fine. I'm more concerned usually about random, you know, executables that you you pull off GitHub or something without reading the code from, you know, random. <laughs> random I would never do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I think as long as you're sort of upfront about the fact that there's data collection going on, um, you know, I like the way going back to, Apple, you know, you set up a device. It's the same when Windows, you know, do you want to turn this on? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, yes, no, away you go. So I think Microsoft have done a good job. I'm personally a fan of collecting data from the standpoint of I want to make the customer experience as good as possible. Right, right. You know, I wish I would you know. see it that way. Yeah. Well, there's also the element of you're talking about a global community. The world has gotten smaller. By, I mean, we say we've got customers in 120 countries, right? And people say, oh, my God, that's amazing. It's like it's the nature of a modern business yeah. that sells online, right? And then you start to think about it. Okay, so there might be like, uh, what is there, 20-odd 20, 20 million software developers will focus on this this market, what percentage of them will always be tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorists, right? Right. <laughs> uh, well, you're addressing the whole market, uh, so there's going to be somebody in there unhappy, right? Yeah. So, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we've. I, I guess we've them. given them a, a super loud voice. <laughs> that yeah. That everybody has the 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 megaphones, but we've got to be mindful, really, of the uh, the vocal minority. Mm-hmm. Frankly, I like my products getting better because they know what functions yeah. I use, rather than you know, not yeah. getting better. That makes sense. <laughs> Yeah. So how can I use an APM solution to help me figure out, you know, what my problems in my applications really are? Yeah. So that's a, that's a good question because historically, um, uh, most of these tools will focus on here's your pretty charts, right? And something goes wrong or maybe an, a score drops a certain level and you get an alert that says, you know, Carl, your site's screwed. You know, you <laughs> figure you. it out. <laughs> and then and then you really have to go through and start doing some spelunking through the data to figure it out. Um no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> one of the things one of the things that we thought was sort of really stupid about that is that surely you should have the idea of known issues. And so I touched on the idea of saying M plus one query. So we'll trigger and we build, uh, I think you've both used our crash reporting product mm-hmm. before where we kind of have the idea that as errors come through, you roll them up. And you can deal with the root cause and then see how many instances and how many customers were affected. We decided we wanted to bring that to APM based on these rules. So you can actually go in and say, here are the active known performance issues. And you can change the rules, like maybe there's performance thresholds. It could be N plus one queries, database queries taking too long. It's a de facto slow log, if you will. Um, Methods taking too long, requests taking too long, all this sort of stuff. And then it can tell you how many traces were impacted and show you a timeline of all of those. So you'd get an alert saying, you know, site screwed, 
probably go in there and you'll see, oh, hang on, this this recent issue is absolutely pumping through the traces. It's hitting everybody. Drill into that. And then you can get right down to like a flame chart of the code execution. You can see the database queries. It actually also integrates directly with your source control system to even say, here's the code that was running. Here's the queries it was emitting. Oh, that's cool. You know, and you look at that and kind of go, Oh yeah, you know, I, I I shouldn't have been coding and drinking at the same time. Um, you know, <laughs> that last this is the issue, um, that sort of thing. So that's that whole idea again of kind of how do we go from the thirty thousand foot view of something went wrong, through to okay, it was this line of code or this database query is really poorly written, um, and that's that's causing issues. Okay. And and this this question is going to have like a super biased answer of course, but like <laughs> what what are the what are sort of the, like the major APM solutions out there and like how do I pick one? I mean, obviously like GDPR is one of those things where like it, it it's just a requirement. So I, I think it was smart putting that in because you know, if you don't have it, a lot of companies will be like, "Nope, it's a non-starter." But like so yeah. what's out there and how do I pick? Well, there's some there's some really big vendors out there. So, um Based on their own marketing, you've got folks like Dynatrace. Um, you know they are super at the, that sort of enterprise end. They have a they have a pretty solid solution, um, and they support multiple different programming languages uh, as well. Uh, they're priced on a per server model, however. Um, New Relic is the one that probably most people know, and I think that's because they've done really well in the mid market category. Um, they, while they support multiple languages, their heritage is kind of around Ruby on Rails. They did really well in that space, um, so they are well known. Another one is um, App Dynamics. Uh, sorry, I should also say New Relic's also priced by server. App Dynamics that got acquired by Cisco uh, about eighteen months ago. Um, they they are also more of that sort of larger big iron end. So that when they got acquired, they had about nineteen hundred customers globally, but they got acquired for. Three point seven billion dollars. So you can, when, when you when you connect that number with nineteen hundred customers, you can kind of get a feel for what this is costing. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, wow. So that that kind of the, the the big three that are out there that are really yeah. like own most of the category. There's a smattering of smaller players, which um, you know I'd, I'd put us in there. We only launched. Uh, two weeks ago, we're starting off with support for .NET. Mm-hmm. One of the things that we – and we plan to go with uh, a bunch of different languages over the next 12 months. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to experiment with, even as a business, I'm not sure how it's going to turn out, is a price per trace. So as data comes in – so if you were using a microservices architecture, you would say – Okay, well, I might have a thousand servers, but yeah, it might actually be technically the same as getting one server that's got 250 cores and five mm-hmm. terabytes of RAM. Um, that'll have no cost difference if you had that many servers. Well, that's actually keeping a lot of people out of these uh, larger organizations, larger APM providers, because again, I, I'm not here to tell you that they have you know bad products. They have really good products, but they were built at a time that was different. Mm-hmm. Right, so supporting the new ways that people build code, the idea that they want to pay per usage, not per server, they want to be told here's an actual issue rather than try and figure it out based on the data. All of those sorts of things are the the fresh things we're trying to bring. But you know, I'd be I'd be lying if I said that we have the maturity of what they have in there. We hope that we cost you less yeah. and we give you a much better experience for the the development team um, in there. Um, and it's my job to figure out how do I you know go out and take their scalps in the long run. If you were a person who was picking today, if you were looking at .NET, I'd obviously ask you to have a look at us. Mm-hmm. Um, but otherwise, I would probably start because these things, with the exception of us, are quite expensive. I'd probably start on their pricing pages and figure out, firstly, you know, <laughs> yeah, can, can we even this? afford to go down this road? <laughs> yeah. uh, and then, and then, sort of, if you can, with the various providers, they all run trials and things like that that you can test out. Some of those bigger ones will make you talk to a salesperson before they kick it off, but um, you know that 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 can be fine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd start there because it is an expensive category to to bring in, and it's also the sort of tooling that um, you don't want to invest in and then not really use because firstly it is expensive, but secondly it is designed to try and. Uh, reduce the downtime and impact on customers and accelerate the time that the software team or ops team can improve the the product when they have an outage. The last thing you want is this thing not to work when there's a problem. Um, so 
knowing that it's not just the cash investment that you've got to make, but actually train the team and all of that. That's where we're investing heavily, for example, mm-hmm. in customer success, doing training sessions and all of that. Um, so thinking about the cultural impact as well as the product impact and the pricing and all of that, it's, it's quite a complicated um, purchase. Yeah. And I, I will not- say, like having used uh, Raygun in the past, like the the software that, that I know that you've written historically I sort of put it in the same bucket. This is going to be a weird comparison, but I put it in like the bucket of like, uh, you're probably familiar with like Fogcrete software. You know, if you ever install like fog bugs on prem, it's kind of interesting because like they, they were, they were super painstaking and like, dealing with all these edges. It wasn't one of these things where you run like the installer and it's cross your fingers and hopefully, you know, like everything is perfect. And then, and then you call support and it's like, oh, well, did you check this, this, and this like fog, fog bugs, whenever, whenever I install the on-prem version, it would do this thing where it's like, Hey, you have the wrong version of this. Like, like their support was like built into the installer or was like sort of magical. And, and I sort of think of, uh, you know, just based on my experience with Raygun is your company is sort of like the same way. Like it, it just, um, it just works like, and it's, and it's usually like, if, if I were to sort of sit down and say like, how do I want this to work? Um, usually your stuff works that way. Like it's really simple. Like it shouldn't be this complicated. Like I just want to like paste in this line of code and like get started. And then I want to be able to like layer things in. And so that's been my, my experience with it. So that, that's a, that's a big thing I would look at. And I think that falls into like your training and, and, and all of that. But, um, to me, that's, I just, I don't know, to me, like APM is in, in, you know, you talk about cost savings, but it's still overhead, right? Like it's this thing that if I didn't have to do it, I wouldn't do it. If I could still get, if I could magically get cost savings that I could magically keep all my <laughs> stuff running super fast, I absolutely wouldn't run any APM, but guess what? You know, this, this stuff isn't magical, so I have to use it. So I want to use something that's going to, you know, be uh, not too, you know, it's going to take a minimum amount of my time and work well. Are you trying to say our products aren't magical? No, I'm, say, I'm saying I'm saying that they they are as magical as they can be, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> software itself no. is not magical, but um, you know, you guys have done a good job of. Maybe it's like it's almost like a. Let me let me give you an example that might that might explain this a little better. Like, um, you know, you you talk whenever I say like enterprisey software, you get the you know you know what that stuff is like, right? Like, it has to be yeah. like whenever you install like SharePoint on-prem, like SharePoint like takes over the machine, like SharePoint, this machine now is a SharePoint machine. (laughs) And thankfully, like most of that stuff has like moved to the cloud now. Um, But whenever you install SharePoint, it's a SharePoint machine or like exchange or something like that. Like it takes over the, the, the machine and it, it just like like consumes it. Yeah. It's like the Borg. It just like assimilates that machine and that machine has to be set up in a particular, a particular way. And then, and then like software, like what you guys have is sort of at the other end right it's not it's not i don't want to i don't want to say it's not enterprisey but i'm i'm using like enterprisey as like a negative here you know what i mean yeah well i, I <laughs> it, it feels bespoke. it's slick it's slick yeah yeah well, we certainly sell to the enterprise, so we've yeah, got like yeah. Domino's and Avis and HBO But you can do that, that but not be yeah. enterprise. You know what I mean, though? Like, exactly, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I always think it comes back to that uh, sort of customer centricity again, right? Yeah. Which is um, basically whenever I'm trying to set something up, and tell me if you agree. You might disagree with this. Mm-hmm. If I'm setting something up and it's really complicated, like – I actually tend to blame myself. Like, I must be the idiot. I'm (laughs) too stupid to figure this out, right? Um, Now, admittedly, it also makes me not like the product, but it's actually kind of this really weird psychology play. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, I don't want my customers thinking they're stupid for choosing Raygun, right? So I want them to feel like uh, they kind of go, wow, I must be really smart because this was really easy to get up up and running, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that if you do care about the customer, you're going to make sure that that onboarding is as, as easy as possible. You solve as much as you possibly can. It's been interesting, actually, with our APM product. We ran a three-month beta period. And then, like all good software products, we, we, we launched it. And then we discovered a whole, whole new raft of things that people had. And we've been working really hard over the last few weeks just to make sure that we kind of you know go, oh, okay, well, what's a sensible default to solve for this? What's the... Because I don't want I don't want people to have, feel like they're yeah. stupid. For well, and that's the better way up. to solve it instead of putting it in like an ex- obscure FAQ or something. Like, oh. <laughs> you know, make sure this yeah. other application isn't installed because it conflicts. No, just fix it. Like, it should just work. You know. Yep. Yep. So default to work. Yep. Yeah. You mentioned that you know it's it's been in beta for like three months and in production for like two weeks. But in, in that short period of time, have you heard any stories from customers about how it really like? 
save the money or really, you know, found a big problem for them? Yeah, uh, a lot actually. It's been it's been super fun. Um, I, I won't name the competitor out of politeness, um, but one of the one of the customers they so we started selling licenses, well, I guess subscriptions to this uh, within. I think it was about two hours after launching. Um, one one person at a fairly large company came in and said, we can't believe it. We put this in and within, I think it was 45 minutes, we identified an issue with a finalizer that meant that the threads were basically slowly getting all used up because the finalizer would never complete. And we've been using one of these big iron providers for years and it's never helped us find this. <laughs> and we put this in, it was like, boom, there's an issue. You know, and it's like, oh, this is fantastic. And so they've been using us to find all sorts of new categories of issues now. Um, so that, that's that been really heartening. Um, and like I say, we've been using it, obviously, ourselves for even longer than three months. And the team just mm-hmm. sort of sit there going, oh, my God, this just tells me exactly what I, what I need to improve. Um, so that's been cool. But, yeah, customers have been generally very, very happy with what, what we're pulling uh, through Raygun APM for them. Okay. Um, and then I did want to get into, uh, some really quick things like, well, first of all, I wanted to know like how you built this, like what, it, what it language is it? Like, where do you host it? Those types of things. I, yeah. I don't know if you want to talk about any of that. I just, I always yeah, found well, that interesting. Cause I know you talked before about having like, there was some process you had rewritten a node and saw really good performance. So that's why I wanted to ask you. Yeah. So, um, all of the, the product is written, um, in .NET itself. Um, mm-hmm. so the, the web app is still full framework. The API layer is .NET core. We took a new approach to building the ingestion pipeline though. That's now, so we have crash reporting and RUM data still flows through full framework versions of our processing pipeline. We're going to be migrating those, but we built a new, uh, .NET core based one for, uh, the APM data. That's also, horizontally scalable. So that that can just mm-hmm. auto-scale out across multiple servers coming in there for that. Um, in terms of designing it, we, we did spend a bunch of time actually kind of going, well, firstly, what data can we get? And then how would we want to do it? And so we did a whole lot of um, wireframing internally of sort of just going, what would be our dream tool for trying to actually manage our own software? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we got that in place. Um, as mentioned, we're starting off where we're supporting .NET Framework. We've got .NET Core um, probably in beta by the time this is is live. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to make sure that between now and the end of the year, uh, we haven't missed anything in terms of what's coming through in the data. And that'll standardize the data formats. And then we'll, we'll in 2019, be going, okay, well, how do we now take those formats and build the agents to handle things like Ruby and Python and PHP and all of those sorts yeah. of things. What about yeah. Node? Is that something next year you're looking at? Yeah, Node's certainly on the list. We have um, we have quite a lot of demand uh, for a, a whole range of those top sort of five languages yeah. um, in there. I suspect we actually started in the hardest place with, with .NET um, just because there's a lot more open source guidance on how to do this sort of stuff mm. uh, in, in other categories, but you know, I always like to start with the hardest problem, then it gets easier. <laughs> yeah. No, I think, I, I think that's a, a sensible approach though. Yeah. I was going to ask you what language you support, but that, that makes a lot of sense now. And actually that, that brings up a good point too. I mean, I can't, um, I have to use an agent, right? Like I can't just, I can't just send you my own, like, you know, packets of data. Well, um, you do need an agent, uh, installed on the box. However, we do support, um, Azure app. Is it Azure app services? or Azure Web Services, the PaaS yeah. sort of idea that you put it up. So we've built an extension for that. So you can support okay. those like environments. Websites, when yeah. You, yeah, when you can't access the box. Um, so we have support for that. Um, what we do do, and we've done this across all of our products, um, you know, is that you can see the raw data that we actually received. Mm-hmm. And you can even do that for the packets of data that come up for a Raygun APM. Now, Truth be told, in crash reporting land, it's it's relatively easy to build something that will send that data. Um, I would be impressed if anybody was building something that sent it for an APM product because it's quite a hard thing to do. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. If any of the <laughs> if anybody listening wants to wants to help out on that, you know, give yeah. Me now out. that I now <laughs> that I think about it, that would be, that would be pretty <laughs> pointless. Maybe maybe a better question was would be like, can I send can I send custom events that type of thing. You can't do custom events today. Uh, mm. That's that's coming shortly. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other quick questions, Carl? Otherwise, I want to wrap this up. 
I think the last one we always like to talk about is, you know, you know, what isn't your APM solution cost? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, that's a good question. I mentioned that we do it on a per trace basis. Um, and so what that means is you can come and sign up for, I think, I mean, there's a 14 day free trial. Um, and then you can uh, choose a tier and that includes a number of traces. So um, by that, I mean, uh, you might get say a million request traces included I'll just bring up the pricing, make sure I actually give you the real numbers. <laughs> all right. Yeah. For MS Dev Show listeners, it's all free. Yeah. <laughs> so so it's uh, $79 a month if you were to take out an annual contract to do 250,000 request traces a month. Okay. Um, and then what we do is we charge 0.000316 cents per trace after that. Um, and then that price goes down as you move up uh, to higher tiers. And the thing that's nice about this is 250,000 traces, depending on your architecture, maybe four or five servers, right? Mm -hmm. And if you were in New Relic land, you'd do an annual contract and be paying $150 per month per server. Mm -hmm. So you you can yeah. kind of see the order of magnitude. It's a frac yeah, it's a fraction of that. Yeah. Well, and and so if you get the free trial, like you can throw this out there and you can figure out your exact cost then. Well, maybe not exact, but you can figure out you know, approximately how many traces you're going to want to do. Yeah. So that, that was the plan is we wanted to make it so people could get a feel for it, see how much they have, but also uh, price it in a way that if it goes over, you're talking about fractions of a penny, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. you and, and we do actually have controls as well around people might want to sample and say, we only want one in every five requests. They might say, we, we want to limit oh, to no overages well, and cool. stop requesting it. That's Which a given good idea. The poor, yeah, we, we again, it's one of those things that just sort of aligns us to what does the customer want? <laughs> well, that saves on like bandwidth too. I mean, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you have so, tons of data, yeah, you could just ramp it down. That's a pretty cool idea. Yeah, well, the way the way we kind of think about, it, like I say, is a big experiment here on this because we wanted something that was disruptive. We know what a lot of our customers have been complaining about with existing products that are out there, and we thought, right, you know, let's let's see what we can do and see if it makes people happier and, and if it works. So so far, a couple of weeks in, it's looking pretty positive. Okay, awesome, congrats. Okay, so let's move on to the most important segment of the show, which is, uh, would you rather? Uh, <laughs> which we actually haven't done in the past couple episodes because we had conferences and things like that. But uh, JD, would you rather eat a head of rotten lettuce or drink a glass of sour milk? Oh, I think I think I'd be a rotten lettuce kind of guy. Yeah, I think um, so too. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't like milk at the best of times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it that stuff gets nasty. So I totally agree there. Would you pick the same thing, Carl? I, if I had to choose between the two, yes, but uh, <laughs> neither, <laughs> that would be the best option. Okay. So JD, where, where can people find you? Uh, personally, I'm on uh, Twitter at Trask JD, T-R-A-S-K-J-D. Mm -hmm. And uh, now that I know that, you know, we're trying to drive a hundred new followers, I've got a challenge on my hands. <laughs> Over to Chapalo. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and for Raygun itself, we're at raygun.com, R-A-Y-G-U-N. Uh, I keep he I keep hearing that Americans hear me saying Reagan like the old president, <laughs> um, but it's Reagan like the blaster. Um, and then on on Twitter for the company, it's uh, it's Reagan IO on Twitter. So yeah. okay, very cool. And where can people find you, Carl? You can find me on Twitter at Carl Schweitzer. And you can find me on Twitter at twitter.com slash ytechie. So JD, thank you so much for coming on here and talking to us about APM. Hopefully uh, everybody listening is using one. And if not, uh, go check out what is available out there. And uh, so thank you for coming on here and talking to us about that. Thank you very much for having me. It's always a, a real pleasure to come.